Myron Swiston here. This is our second plus one, we are third uh, presentation on art materials on YouTube. And I'm going to pick up where I left off on my second uh, video, which was on the Masonite panels. Now, the Masonite company who used to make this material is no longer making this material, which is in an umbrella. Masonite. It is now basically known as hardboard, but still called many places Masonite. This particular Masonite or hardboard is one eighth smooth and on the back has the mechanical texture. It's been heat pressed to give it this wiggly little, you can see that there on the side, it wiggles somewhat. Uh, some artists choose the textured side, some choose the smooth side. It is a viable painting surface, but beware the preparation involved uh, in this product. Some artists work in their studios with this in mind, 4x8 sheets doing murals, which may or may not be temporary or may be permanent. Uh, if they do them in their studio 4x8, then they're going to be hung up somewhere on a concrete wall, cement wall, and they're quite heavy at this point. But this has a design for that purpose that the uh, longevity perhaps may not last all that long outside uh, versus moisture and uh, temperature differences and variance in the, the quality of this material. But in order to prepare this material, let's say for small scale painting, easel painting, could be up to 16 by 20, 18 by 24. Because this is made with wood chips, heat set, glue, resin, and who else knows what's inside? There might be some oil inside. If we're going to use this as our material, we need to gesso this first. Okay, We could lightly sand this surface. Um, perhaps I would suggest that. Put one coat of acrylic gesso on this and let it set a week or do a number of these and have four or five or a dozen already uh, ready to go. Um, the thing with this is that this is very uh, acidic and so we want to create a barrier uh, so that we reduce the amount of support induced discoloration. But gesso is not a barrier. It is an absorbent ground. Meaning this, gesso, uh, you can see that it is a white color. If you're somebody who wants to do a drawing, it's white. Or you could tint the gesso if you like a sepia or brown or red or whatever color you might like. You could temp, uh, tint your gesso with that amount of acrylic to give you a slight tint. That sets up uh, your first layer. And after we come back and do the second layer, you might sand this again. And then maybe on this one, I would really suggest the three layers on this and let it set up. So we're looking at a three-week cycle. And then it should be ready for your painting. Nice thing about this is, it, is that it is rigid. So if you're doing a preliminary uh, pencil drawing on the surface with the gesso, you can see your drawing. And that's okay. You can fix your drawing afterwards. Uh, in graphite, you can fix it, or charcoal, you can fix it. Um, but as a substrate, uh, it is inexpensive, but has long-term consequences because of what inherently what it is, glue, wood chips, and so on. But this can be placed on the cradle we talked about last uh, viewing, we talked about the birch and being cradled. The masonite could be also cradled in various sizes and so on, like this. As you can see, it's bound on there. Longevity, though, I'm still questioning longevity of, of this masonite, what is now known as hardboard. Um, I've seen hardboard now. Let me just come back to this. I've seen hardboard like this, but lighter in color out of old construction sites that were used perhaps maybe in the 20s and the 30s, which was called hardboard, much thicker, could have been uh, maybe quarter inch, maybe even thicker, that had this kind of configuration, smooth and textured on one side. I think that may be good, uh, if you can find some of those, 
and paint on those. They're, they're around. But a good alternative, let me come back to this birch. Birch is available in sheets uh, up to 4x8 and so on. There's also poplar, there's also oak, um, veneer. The problem with these veneers, they're very thin, but you could get a quarter inch veneer. That's possible. But if the point with these uh, panels, whether they're birch or oak or poplar, they have to be cradled. This is cradling. The, when you get into some of this wood product, hard wood product, birch panels and so on, you see that this is a solid uh, support. But the cradling on here is quite extensive. We have 40 inches here by 24, and I'm just going to show you this. You can see the cradling in order to support and give you dimensional stability throughout this surface. And on the other side um, is just your birch veneer, um, 1 8 birch veneer, which is legitimate. But without cradling uh, the birch veneers or the oak veneers, poplar, uh, veneer without cradling them, you're going to run into a problem. They're going to warp because they are uh, sandwiched. They're like very thin layers of birch. One goes this way, one, not unlike plywood. One goes this way, one goes this way, that one goes this way. So the dimensional stability varies because we're using again a natural material and we're relying upon the gluing and the adhesion, gluing, adhesion, gluing, adhesion over a number of layers to get to where we need to be. And so it should be cradled, as we've shown you. Um, one of the things I did say I was going to come back to, uh, which I missed, was a canvas, uh, stretch, uh, stretchers that can take your stretch canvas. But I wanted to show you this one here. Um, again, I want to show you what is the keys. These are keys here, here, here. And you can see in all corners there's keys. These keys really are there for the museum or perhaps incorrect uh, stretching, incorrect tipping on the front, but they're there, they're provided there. And you notice the way the stretcher is constructed. Again, it's heavy cross pieces. Um, this is uh, one and a quarter by two and a half this way. So it's a legitimate product. But there is a front and there's a rip, there is a back. The back part, of course, um, we have screws in here on the back to make sure that this uh, stretched uh, piece, the strain, and here's not stranger, stretchers that are done correctly. Okay, I put this together, I made sure of this. One of the things we always use when we put these uh, stretchers together, we always make sure they're square. So use one of these uh, uh, 90 degree uh, set square, which works. And I've done it on all four corners. So you can see that there's no daylight in between here. That's important to get them square. No matter what size, the bigger they are, of course, the more important <laughs> it is to make sure they're square. And of course, the other uh, thing I use to make them square, I use the set square, of course, and then go corner uh, corner to corner, so the opposite corner all the way up to here, and then the same on the other side, so that I know that the uh, dimensional stability is there by measurement from a diagonal across here, diagonal across here, so I have a square stretcher. Now the thing with this, we're always dealing with natural materials, of course, and there's some variance in natural materials, so sometimes if it says that it's uh, one and a half, it could be one and a little bit more, a little bit less. But overall, we're saying that they're one and a half, uh, say this way, and two and a half this way, or one and a quarter this way, and two and a half this way. This is a natural material, so it's not unlike what we find outdoors. Everything is breathing, hydroscopic, as we've discussed before. And, and overall, everything is alive, so we're dealing with natural materials. We're not dealing with steel. Uh, at this point, but we are dealing with natural stretchers, but they can be handled. Now the galleries, when you sell your work, you spend a lot of time, you built up your career. The galleries, when you get into galleries or somebody um, who is buying your paintings, the thing with this whole thing, 
is this, is that they turn the painting around. And I always kind of say to them, turn this painting around. And if you turn the painting around, you'll see behind me, wow, how it's framed. And then we were talking about, again, the amount of materials used, the hangover, the being able to have the stress from piece to piece to piece all the way along, the canvas is stretched correctly. There is a, a canvas, painted canvas on the other side. But I wanted to show you the back so that a buyer or gallery, when they get your canvases, they're gonna say, wow, this person, this artist has spent a lot of time looking at his work and trying to give the best possible work out there. Now, let me come just say a quick thing about uh, the kind of uh, stovepipe painters that were in the 40s and 50s. That was was available at that time. So stovepipe enamels, red and blue, yellow, orange, there were some purples. Stovepipe paints, which were enamel, made to be put on stovepipes in your home to cover over the steel color and the rust and discoloration. Some artists at that time were using a drip technique, could have been Jackson Pollock, but archivally, the surfaces, they have a tray underneath some of these to collect the enamel that's falling off of these paintings because of the means that was employed. Of course, artists, they bend the rules, they do whatever they so desire, but in keeping with going forward with good materials, we're going to attempt always to make um, use uh, good means all the time. Um, so the other thing I forgot, I did maybe mention, but I'm going to mention, on the back you can see it's flat. On the front end, what we do, we allow for the decline in thickness of material here. So when you stretch your canvas here, you have the canvas only touching the wood here, and as it falls away, of course, there's going to be no canvas touching any of this wood from here uh, to here. And if you do see somebody's with a canvas, a painted canvas, and you see it square mark on the inside here, <laughs> you know that they're not stretched correctly and they're not using this uh, incline here to do that correctly. I also did show you, I'm sorry, I also did show you this, uh, the three inch, again, that's your back, as you can see, it's got a ridge here and it's got a ridge here, but on the inside surface, you can see it's declining. It gets thicker here, narrower here as you go uh, toward making your stretch canvas. And again, the same thing holds true. I do the set square, okay, on the corners, okay, so that the uh, stretchers are square and your canvas will buckle because everything, all the material here has been squared up uh, to the canvas. I also wanted to talk about um, some other materials uh, which I'm going to do um, in my next video, but I wanted to cover some of this that I've already covered, but to go into depth, um, in depth with the materials. Now, the other thing when we come back to um, the gessoing on this product, on the masonite, when we come back to this, this now becomes, when you apply paint to it, it's an absorbent ground for your paint or your pencil or your charcoal. What that does then is that because acrylic gesso is made with acrylic, it's made with calcium carbonate, some people call it limestone, there's also an amount of uh, titanium white in there, they're all compounded together and so what you have, because it is acrylic, acrylic plastic, it, it looks hard but it does breathe. It does move back and forth. So the surface of your gesso is flexible as this surface uh, moves. And that inhibits the, the, the transmigration from the substrate up to the surface because we have these three layers that we're dealing with as a good absorbent ground and also providing uh, some barrier against the discoloration that's going to occur from this masonite. And thanks for now. I'm going to see you soon. Uh, I'm going to do some stretching uh, coming forward, proper stretching, stretching techniques, staples, tension. Uh, we showed you some uh, tympan 
and I think I like that idea, Tempen, and we'll move forward. And thank you for your time again. It's been exciting. Bye.